Reading through the Bible in one year, November 17th, 1 Chronicles chapters 9 through 10, Hebrews chapter 12, Amos 6, in Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 80. So, all Israel was control, rather was enrolled by genealogies, and behold, they are all, rather they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. And Judah, who was carried away into exile to Babylon for their unfaithfulness. Now, uh, the first who lived in, in their possessions in the excuse me in their cities were Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the and the temple servants. Some of the sons of Judah of the sons of Benjamin and of the sons of Ephraim and Manasseh lived in Jerusalem. Uthai, the son of Amihud, the son of Omri, the son of Imri, the son of Bani, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. From the Shilonites were uh, Azaiah, Azaiah, sorry, Azaiah, there we go, uh, the firstborn and his sons. From the sons of Zerah were Jeuel and their relatives, 690 of them. From the sons of Benjamin were Salu, the son of Meshulam, the son of Hadiva, the son of Hasanua, and Ib Ibnea, the son of Je excuse me, the son of Jerum, and Elah, the son of Uzi, the son of Mikri, the son of Meshulam, the son of Shephathiah, or she sorry, Shephathiah, the son of Reuel, the son of Ibnijah, and their relatives, according to their generations, nine hundred and fifty-six. All these were heads of fathers' households, according to their fathers' houses. From the priests uh, were Jediah, Je Jeho Jehoirib, Jachin, and Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, or sorry, Zadok, the son of Mariah, the son of Ahitub, the chief officer of the house of God, and Adiah, the son of Joram, the son of Pashur, the son of Malchijah, the son of Masai, sorry, Masai, the son of Adiel, the son of Jazerah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Meshulamith, the son of Immer, and, and their relatives, heads of their father's households, 1,760 very able men uh, for the work of the service of the house of God. Of the Levites were Shemaiah, the son of Hashub, the son of Azrakam, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Morari, and uh, Bakbakar, Haresh, and Galal, and Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zikri, the son of Asaph, and Obadiah, the son of Sh Shemaiah, the son of Galal, the son of Jeduthun, and Barakiah, the son of Azza, the son of Elkanah, who lived in the villages of the Netophathites. Now, the gatekeepers were Shalom and Akub, and Talman and Ahiman, and their relatives, Shalom the chief, being stationed until now at the king's gate to the east. These were the gatekeepers for the camp of the sons of Levi. Shalom, the son of Korah, the son of uh, Ebiasaph, the son of Korah, and his relatives of his father's house, the Korahites, were over the work of the service, keepers of the threshold of the tent, the thresholds of the tent, and their fathers had been camp, rather had been over the camp of the Lord, keepers of the entrance. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, was ruler over them previously, and the Lord was with him. Zechariah, the son of Meshelamiah, was gatekeeper of the entrance of the tent of meeting. All these uh, who were chosen to be gatekeepers at the thresholds were 212. These were enrolled by genealogy in their villages, whom David and Samuel the seer appointed in their office of trust. So they and their sons had charge of the gates of the house of the Lord, even the house of the tent, as guards. The gatekeepers were on the four sides, east, west, uh, east, west north, and south. Their relatives in their villages were to come in every seven days from time to time to be with them. For the four chief gatekeep, uh, for the four chief gatekeepers who were Levites were in an office of trust and were over the chambers and over the treasuries in the house of God. They spent the night around the house of God because the watch was committed to them, and they were in charge of opening it morning by morning. Now some of them had charge of the t uh, utensils of service, for they counted them when they brought them in and when they took them out. 
Some of them also were appointed over the furniture, and over all the utensils of the sanctuary, and over the fine flour, and the wine, and the oil, and the frankincense, and the spices. Some of the sons of the priests prepared the mixing of the spices. Mattathiah, one of the Levites, who was the firstborn of Shalom the Korahite, had the responsibility over the things which were baked in pans. Some of their relatives, of rather, some of their relatives of the sons of the Kohathites, were over the uh, showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. These singers, or now these are the singers, heads of father's households of the Levites, who lived in the chambers of the temple, free from other service, for they were engaged in their work day and night. These were heads of father's households of the Levites according to their generations, chief men who lived in Jerusalem. In Gibeon, Jael, the father of Gibeon, lived, and his wife's name was Maacah, and the first and his firstborn son was Abdon, then Zur, Kish, Baal, or Baal, Ner, Nadab, Gedor, um, Ahio, Zechariah, and Mikloth. Mikloth became the father of Shimeam, and they also lived with their relatives in Jerusalem opposite their other relatives. Ner became the father of Kish, and Kish became the father of Saul, and Saul became the father of Jonathan, Malchai Shua, Abinadab, and Eshbaal. A son of Jonathan was Merabael, and Merabael became the father of Micah. The sons of Micah were Pithon, Melech, Tereah, and Ahaz. Ahaz became the father of Jara, and Jara became the father of Elimeleth, and Asmaveth, and Zimri. And Zimri became the father of Mosa. And Mosa became the father of Benaiah, and Rephiah his son, Eleazar his son, Azel his son. Azel had six sons, whose names are these, Azrakam, Bokaru, Ishmael, uh, Shariah, Obadiah, and Hanan. These are the sons of Azel. There's a lot of notes here on the side. I'm going to scroll through them so you can be sure to get them. Now, chapters 10 through 12, verse 40, which is basically the end of 12, um, it covers David's rise of power, uh, rather, rise to power over Israel. Now, the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines closely pursued Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan, Abinadab uh, and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle became heavy against Saul, and the archers overtook him, and he was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it. Otherwise, the un these uncircumcised will come and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he likewise fell on his sword and died. Thus Saul died with his three sons, and all those of his house died together. When all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that uh, they had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. It came about on the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers around the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols, their gods, and their people. Why do they have to carry this, this news to their gods? Because their gods are no gods at all. They put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the house of Dagon. When all Jabesh Gilead heard all the, uh, that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh. And they buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his trespass, which he committed against the Lord because of the word of the Lord, which he did not keep. And also because he asked counsel of a medium making inquiry of it, and did not instead inquire of the Lord. Therefore he killed him. Who killed him? God killed Saul, and turned the kingdom to David, uh, the son of Jesse. 
making sure you get all the notes in here. All right, there we go. And let's move over to Hebrews chapter 12. The author of Hebrews continues, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, which is this great cloud of witnesses? Well, he just went through in chapter 11 and detailed uh, this massive list of all of these people who have had such great faith in God ahead of us. Now, this could also be interpreted to be, um, let me see if there's a note on this here. Yeah, this is a really long note. I'm not going to read it, but I'll give you basically the gist of it. So there's, there's a couple different ways to see this. First, uh, the great cloud of witnesses surrounding us could first be um, just other, um, sorry, the the thought might be that um, these witnesses, these uh, great people of the faith who went before us, they are now witnesses to what we're doing from heaven. They're instead of worshiping God and serving him forever, they decided to open the windows of heaven and look downward and see everything it is that we're doing, like were their television that they could just watch when they're busy. Sorry, when they're not busy. So that's one of the what that's one of the views that people have from this text. And I've seen a lot of people build this up, but I, I personally don't believe it. So the second one, because again, they have all of Christ in his glory and work in heaven to be done. I don't think they're going to waste their time looking at us and what we're doing. The next great cloud of witnesses uh, could also be the people who surround them, the people in their families or within their own churches, other Christians. Um, that could be the case. Another option would be the unrepentant around us, the non-converted heathens non-Christians, uh, who would look at us, and we've all seen this before, uh, where we have our friends who are, uh, or, or family members who are not Christians, they're constantly looking at you, waiting for you to fall in any way that they see might be some sort of um, measure of true Christianity. So they can go, oh, pff, he did that, therefore he's not a real Christian. He's a hypocrite, just like I thought. Okay. But we see these same uh, people who are um, also the, um, so, so they're, they're also living their lives, following after their own hopes and dreams and, and whatever it happens to be, because they're focused on worshiping themselves, not on worshiping the God of all creation. So yeah, they don't understand that Christians are, uh, in our nature, hypocrites. We're doing everything we can, but we're still going to fail up until the time we die. This is why, and I've said it a bunch of times before, a Christian life is a life of continual repentance. We wake up, we sin, we repent, we go on. That's how it goes. But we trust in the finished work of Christ to cover our sins. First, that it's sufficient to cover everything that we have uh, done against him for our entire lives, and second, that it is efficient and that it's been applied directly to our lives, and we truly believe that. So what is this great cloud of witnesses that we're talking about here? I think that it's our view. I, I could be wrong. I can read the note from the uh, Reformation Study Bible because it's a lot shorter, but I'll make it easy and I'll just read theirs. So the readers are, in effect, running a race before a great crowd of people who have already finished the race with honors. These people who have finished um, are the people enumerated in chapter 11, which we just read about. Now, their example encourages readers and admonishes them if they should stumble. That's the point I was trying to get to. It's not that they've opened the windows of heaven and staring down at us or that they're watching us in true, you know, HD, whatever in heaven uh, to, 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 to see our lives and how they work out and they're rooting for us or whatever. Uh, it's not that, but these are witnesses in the fact that um, they are witnesses to the fact that they could serve God, not perfectly, not by any means, but that they could serve God with faith. 
faith that he is who he says he is, faith that um, his work is sufficient and efficient, as we've already stated, and also faith that he will give us the end result, which is our hope. Which is nothing to happen in this life or in this realm, but it's our hope in the eternal realm when we die and pass through that veil of death and step into eternity with Christ. That is our hope. That's the same hope that they had. They just didn't know his name was Jesus the Christ. They just knew him as the coming Messiah. All right, let's move on. So, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, people who have done the work before us, surrounding us, let us also, along with as they did, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that for the purpose of you will not grow weary and lose heart. We must continually um, recognize the fact that Jesus has endured and completed it for us on our behalf. God isn't hoping we're going to do a perfect job at anything because he knows that our perfect job was completed in, in the Christ. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. I love my children, and that is why I discipline them, so that they learn the things that they should do and those that they should not. So that they promise, not promise, but they, they serve God properly to the best of their ability. Again, I'm not asking perfection out of them. Um, but that they serve God well in their lives. And that they act appropriately in, in all situations. I do this because I love them. If I didn't love them, if I didn't care for them, then I wouldn't care what they did. They're like people who just let their kids scream at them and hit them and cuss at them and, and all of those other things. I would just let them do whatever they felt like if I didn't love them the way that Christ loves me, the way that God the Father has loved me by disciplining me in my own life. But if you, rather, uh, it, it, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. He's saying this is a rite of passage for you as a Christian. You will endure suffering. You will endure hardship. Some of which because of your own sin. Some of which because of the curse. These things will happen to you. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and, and we respected them. Shall we not uh, much rather uh, be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God the Father, disciplines us for our good so that for the purpose of we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who, um, who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. 
pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Again, this is not something we can absolutely guarantee, but this is something we are going to do our best to try to uh, take care of. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. That there be no uh, immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a, to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which, uh, which sound that was such that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. Now, if you haven't read through, um, or, or if you aren't familiar with the Old Testament, um, this might be confusing for you, or if you haven't read through the book of Exodus, but this is what happened when the people stood before the Lord and God decided to reveal himself to the people of Israel whom he had just taken out of Egypt. They had just, he had just led them straight through um, the, the, the Red Sea on dry land. They've seen all of these miracles, all of these things he was doing. He stood on the mountain before them and he told them, no one's allowed to come to the mountain. No one's allowed to touch it. And God told Moses to set up guards to keep people away. But the people stayed away because they were afraid. And then God merely spoke to them. He told them the words of his Ten Commandments. That's all he said. But to them, it sounded like a, a, a blast of a trumpet that never ended. And that the words which came were as if it was um, thunder and fire, and it terrified them. And they told Moses, look, what, whatever God says we will do, but you represent us before him, and then you come down and tell us, because we don't want to see this again. They were so terrified of who God was. Of course, you know, 30 days later, they started worshiping idols. Verse 20, for they could not bear the command, even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned to death. You don't go up and touch the animal to kill it because it itself has become holy, but you have to throw stones at it until it is dead. And so terrible was the sight that Moses, Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. We haven't come to that mountain, to the mountain of the law. But what, what, what mountain have we come to? We have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriad of angels, to the great assembly and the church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Jesus the Christ, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, complete, and to Jesus, the mediator of this new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it to e that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not, rather, if those did not escape when they refused him, uh, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him, who warns us from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more will I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, uh, since we receive a, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. 
for our God is a consuming fire. There's all the notes. Let's move on to Amos chapter 6. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountains of Samaria, the distinguished men of the foremost of, of nations, to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalna and look, and go from here to there uh, to, to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms? Or, or is their territory greater than yours? Do you put off the day of calamity? And would you bring near the seed of violence? Those who recline on beds of ivory and, and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. Who improvise to the sound of the harp and, like David, have composed songs for themselves. Who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils. Yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the sprawler's banqueting will pass away. The Lord God has sworn by himself, since he can swear by nothing higher, the Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that it contains. And it will be, if ten men are left in one house, they will die. Then one uh, one's uncle or his undertaker will lift him up to carry out his bones from the house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, Is anyone else there with you? And that one will say, No one. Then he will answer, Keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is, is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces, and the small house to fragments. Do horses run on rocks? Or, 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 or does one uh, plow them with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood or bitterness. You who rejoice in Lodabar and say, Have we not our own strength, uh, by our own strength, taken Carnaim for ourselves? Or Carnaim for ourselves? Basically saying that they've done it on their own without God helping them. For behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God of hosts. And they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. There's all the notes. All right, let's go on to Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 80. Now, at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her uh, womb leapt. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And now it has happened to me that, uh, rather, and how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has, uh, what has been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regard, or rather, he has had regard for the humble estate of his bond slave, his servant. For behold, from this time on, 
uh, from this time on all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who are humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned home. Now, the time has come or had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child following the law of Moses, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There's no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called, because clearly she was wrong, right? And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was opened. And his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. And fear came upon all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them kept uh, kept in mind, rather, and all who heard them kept them in mind, saying, "Well, what then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with them." And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to to grant to us that, or to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called I'm making sure we don't lose any spots here. Okay, there we go. Uh, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace." And the child continued to grow, and he became strong in spirit. And he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. All right, that's all for today. Um, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold, the word of the Lord.